Okay, uh, seeing a presence of a quorum and calling to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee at 6.02 p.m. on Monday, June 14th. Um, and we'll begin with um, roll call attendance. Uh, when I call your name, please state present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. And McDonald present. Um, so we are in order. And our first item on our agenda um, is to vote. Um, Ms. Ms. Spitzer? I think you might have might not be able to see Mr. Sullivan. Oh, yes, I can't. Sorry. I, I always forget. I have to adjust. Um, I see you. Dr. Morris, maybe it would be helpful if somebody could explain to me how I make a default to always be automatic, but it's not auto. It's, it says it's automatic with a maximum of nine, and I have to do it every single time. Sorry. Mr. Sullivan? Present. Okay. We are in order. Um, before we go actually to item our next item which is to vote to enter into executive session i wanted to uh, um uh check in with dr morris if he wanted to share a quick update before we move on uh, i do i would like to just briefly share an email that was sent to all amherst regional middle school families uh, about two hours ago um, and I'm just going to literally read the, the email. Um, I'm not going to offer more updates, but it is a um, significant event in our community. And I did want to communicate both with the school committee as well as the larger community about it. Uh, this email was written with the permission of the family. So I am going to name a student name, but that's being done with the permission of um, the family of the child. Dear ARMS -A -A or ARMS families, I'm writing to share that one of our armed students, eighth grader Nate Squires, has been involved in an incident that occurred outside of school and is in critical condition at a local hospital. We are in touch with Nate's family and making sure they're getting all the support possible. Parents or guardians are encouraged to talk to their children tonight so they can share their questions and concerns about their classmate with you. It is our sincere goal to make sure you and students have resources and support um, so school counselors as well as trauma counselors from Tra Riverside Trauma Center are available for students. Please note that students who are participating in remote learning can access counselors by contacting the principal's office at 362-1850. Resources for talking with your children and traumatic incidents were attached to the email and 24-hour crisis support is available through clinical and support options at 413-586-5555. Thank you for your care with this important matter. Uh, I think the only thing I'll share is as the situation evolves, we'll be back in touch with families. Um, a similar email that did not name the student was sent to all families uh, in all of our seven schools in the district, or the six of the other six of the seven schools uh, in the district. But in conversations with uh, staff and family uh, this evening, they were comfortable with this becoming a more public uh, piece of information. And that's why we uh, emailed all middle school families. And, and I'm sharing that tonight. So. Um, I think uh, it's a tragic situation. Uh, we'll be able to share more uh, as it develops. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves with that, but um, um, there's no no further word I can use than tragic and tra words I can use than tragic and serious for this situation. Um, and I think that's as all I have to share on that one. But uh, for people watching in the community as well as the committee, as the situation develops, we'll be communicating throughout uh, about. Um, about Nate, about his family, about all the students in the district and how we'll continue to support folks for uh, the remaining days we have in the school year and then heading into summer uh, as well uh, as the situation requires. Thank you. Um, uh, so moving on, um, we will now vote to enter into executive session according to MDL Chapter 30A, Section 21.3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the APA if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares, and I do declare, 
with the intention of returning to open session. Uh, so moved, is there a second? Second. Uh, moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So we will now move into executive session. Um, our anticipated return is 6.30 p.m. Yes, sir. Uh, welcome back. Um, we are now uh, moving on to public comment. Um, and I, we have one public comment and I will share my screen right now. Um, so as always, um, our public comment document will be posted on the agendas page of our regional school committee website. Um, and we have no voicemail comments, um, so we will move right along to our next item of business, which is um, a discussion on subcommittee meetings and structures um, and policy. So we started this discussion at our last meeting um, where we were looking at our, our policy and talking about um, advisory committees um, as well as subcommittees, membership, meetings, how many we have, whether we need them all, all of that. Um, the policy subcommittee um, met last week. And, and it's, <laughs> it's like all blurring. I'm seeing um, Ms. Spitzer nodding her head um, and reviewed um, our current policy. Um, as well as considered um, proposing a new policy for advisory committees. So both of those documents are in our packet. Um, and I will suggest that we start with the current policy, which is actually second in, the, in our packets, um, which is on page 54, um, and it's policy BDE. So some of the, the edits on here um, are being proposed by the policy subcommittee and are based off of both the model pol or the reference policy from the MASC, which for folks not familiar with that, that's the Massachusetts Association of School Committees um, and puts, who puts together a reference policy manual for um, districts around the state to use. Um, so some of the edits are based on that. Some of the edits are also looking at other um, districts that have um, similar um, policies that are modeled off of the, the model policy, such as the standing subcommittees. So I'll just um, highlight some of the uh, changes. Um, the key change here is removing and task forces in that first, in that first sentence um, and addressing task forces in the, the new proposed policy of advisory committees. Um, and then also just clarifying, which we, we, our practice is to do this, but we don't have it codified in our, in our policy, which is to um, appoint members at our annual organizational meeting um, for a period of one year. So those, that, that, those pieces were recommended in the model policy. Um, in the bullets, removing again in the first bullet, the task force, because that will be addressed in the advisory committee. Um, Adding in that it's the not just the committee chair that appoints a subcommittee chair, but seeks the but with the approval of the committee. Um, and then removing the membership statement that is in our current policy. Um, and we what we did is we cut it from this policy and pasted that into the proposed advisory committee policy so that subcommittee membership 
um, in, this, in this proposed policy would be limited to school committee members. Um, the other thing that we added was that the committee chair and superintendent or their delegate um, will be ex officio members of all subcommittees. Um, and that is also in recognition that particularly on the policy subcommittee, we do have um, uh, Ms. Westmoreland as our delegate um, from Dr. Morris on that committee. Um, and I believe also in the budget subcommittee, Dr. Slaughter is, is an ex officio member of that as well. We um, then are proposing adding in, which is at the recommendation of the MS MASC policy, um, to acknowledge um, standing subcommittees um, in, in our core policy. So we um, consolidated, our, our proposing consolidating down to three so that we have three subcommittees and then also codifying that we ideally would strive for membership in each subcommittee to have at least um, two member towns present in, in that. So no subcommittees of just Amherst or Pelham, um, or only Pelham or only Amherst in there. Um, so this, the core uh, subcommittees we're proposing are budget and audit. So folding in audit into the budget subcommittee I guess, and sometimes it has been, audit has been done on, with those budget subcommittees, sometimes not. Um, the policy subcommittee and the superintendent evaluation subcommittee. So those are the key changes. And just for reference, the, because um, I'm not sure if it's on our website, but that's one of the things that we'll be signing ourselves up to is to be more, um, deliberate in publicizing who are members of each of our subcommittees. So just for folks watching at home, Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Spitzer, myself, and Ms. Westmoreland um, are the members of the policy subcommittee. Any questions, comments? Mr. Denley. No, this is a scintillating administrator topic um but 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 an important an important one as as we try to establish more consistent norms um so thank you to the policy subcommittee i think i think overall this, this is this is good it's it's cleaner it's 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 more well organized um just a couple of minor points um so uh, appointing members at the annual organizational meeting um I maybe would add something like if possible or 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 as needed i just wouldn't if if we missed you know that one meeting Right. And then as the year went on, it became clear that we needed, say, a regional assessment method subcommittee or something like that. Um, we wouldn't want to tie our hands that we that we had missed the, the opportunity. So, so something about to submit at the, uh, to short everything up at the annual organizational meeting, but give us a little lee leeway. Um, I like the addition of subject to the approval of the committee with the committee chair appointing members. Um, there's going to be a lot of administrative work to do, but it's certainly not meant to consolidate, you know, authority into that, that one position. Um, so I like, I like giving the full committee that, um, that, that ability, um, you know, otherwise I don't have too, too much more to add. So it's, there is a, a line there that says the subcommittees with their core characters, I think maybe that meant to be their core charges, um, are, yep. um, but otherwise I like, I like this, I like this, um, I like this, uh, structure. Uh, Ms. Lord. Yes, um, thank you to the subcommittee, policy subcommittee for being in the weeds and making it more um, accessible and clear for the rest of us. I do have um, a question or two. So with the SETF, which has a heavy public involvement, the only voting members are school committee members that sit on that subcommittee, correct? Oh, and you want the second question? Okay. And then the second question is in regards to the CES subcommittee that Mr. Sullivan and I are on. Is it different when you are representing a district in a larger body? Um, because that one's a little more complicated. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, you're, what you're getting at is something that we talked about in the policy subcommittee meeting, which is that um, that there's there's 
what we're trying to get is get, get towards is some is being more clear even with exactly that those those examples that you just gave us so ces that's not a subcommittee that's an appointment of a representative to another body right or a liaison and um so there's there's roles or tasks that we on occasion as school committee members we need to appoint somebody to represent us for for that so another example is our representative on CPAC or BPAC, um, CES would be another one, or delegate to the MASC, um, voting delegate to, uh, to the MASC conference. So being clear that those are assignments as opposed to subcommittees, I think, and JLMSC would fall into that as well, right? So we appoint representatives to that. It, the those those meetings being sort of advisory to the regional committee still have to meet open meeting law regardless of whether they're actually a subcommittee or a, that, that it, it's it's one of the requirements so to your question about SETF um, because that has as a body is is we want it to be a, a public and a community um, organization would become this advisory committee that still is subject to open meeting law. Um, and there, you know, whether there's voting or not voting, the purpose of advisory committees, when we get to that policy, you'll see is, is to provide a recommendation or recommendations and advice to, to the full committee, as opposed to passing policy or budgets, right? Thank you. Other, other comments or questions or edits? Not seeing any. So let's move on um, because uh, Ms. Lord took us there. Um, let's move on to the next uh, policy, which is the page before, which is BDF advisory committees to the school committee. Um, and this one, so again, with the goal of sort of, even though it's adding more policy to our ever expanding policy handbook, um, the goal was to sort of provide a little bit more clarity into how we think about these and the roles of the different committees and subcommittees that we have. So this is um, advisory committees would also be created by the school committee in much the same way that a subcommittee would. Um, this would have, um, so this right now as proposed is almost identical to the model policy from, or the reference policy from MASC with a change in terms of membership um, and what we are proposing from the policy committee is that we take much of what we had from the subcommittee uh, policy regarding um, non-school committee members, that that's in item three. So that language is about the only section where we um, provided edits. There was another one that we changed um, from the model policy. So, that, sorry, that's item three. Um, and then Item seven was the other one that we changed. We changed the word fact to data. So again, the intent of this is to provide some more um, guidance for us in understanding how we form committees where we want more than school committee members and we want to bring in um, Mem members of our broader school commun community into advisory work for the school committee. Questions, comments, edits? Mr. Dunley. Yeah, so um, generally speaking, I, th I think this is a really good complement to the other policy. Um, the thing I really like about it is, uh, is, is numbers, uh, number six, where it talks about each committee will be clearly instructed about here's the length of time you're being asked to stir, serve. Here's the resources the committee is providing to you. Here's the reporting dates and structure. Here's the, the term. Here's, here's how you can become a member of the, of the committee. I'm thinking back a little bit to, um, I think we were about to, if I'm not mistaken, Chair McDonald launch a new school committee 
website um, that I think maybe got shelved um, with the return to in-person stuff, but, I, but hopefully we'll be able to get to that soon where it's not just a list of, here's the dates of our meetings and agendas, but here are all of the structures, associated structures with the school committee, right? And then we will be able to then clearly list and communicate to the public, not just the subcommittees we just talked about, but also these um, very important advisory committees, which really are opportunities for the public to engage with us in a more formal way to make recommendations. And I think it would be great if, if there was an easy way for members of the public to go there, to see there, to see that and say, oh, here is an advisory committee on a topic that I really care about. Um, and uh, they, um, members are, this is how members apply to that to that body. And this is when members are appointed. So, oh, I have a few months. Let me reach out and talk to somebody who's been on that committee or contact the chair and ask about it. And just, it, so that it becomes, um, you know, much more publicly known resource. Um, I think there, there's a there's a common and, and I think to a degree valid um, constructive criticism of public bodies that it's, um, you know, it's you have to be in the know in order to really understand what's going on. And so we're always trying to um, uh, make additional efforts for transparency. And I think this could be a really great way to formalize that and say, here's here's a way we're actively encouraging members of the public to formally engage with the school committee uh, in a way where we're providing resources, we're providing a structure, um, and, and then it's it's not just, you know, you have public comment and that's it, right? Um, so I, I really like this. I really like this as a complement to the other policy. Other comments, edits, questions? Dr. Morris? Just very briefly uh, to Mr. Demling, I think uh, Mr. Chair McDonald and I have a training, I think the end of this month, uh, about transitioning to the website, and you're exactly right. The turned in person delayed a bit, but uh, we should be all set by the time things get rolling um, for for some, you know, August and summer meetings. I mean, August and fall meetings. Excuse me. Mr. Harrington. Yeah. So I mean, I pretty much get you know, for like asking a clarifying question here. So that's on the record and in public. So there's the, the part three here where we where it talks about um, residents of the four member towns, parents are or guardians of students, et cetera, et cetera. That also includes like choice in parents of choice in students, right? And just the four. So that would be the only circumstances that someone who is not a member, not a resident of the four member towns, would serve on a task force or advisory committee that's is that correct or yeah um yeah we we had that conversation that we wanted to make sure that parents and guardians of choice students were able to be part of advisory committees they obviously have a vested interest and they're part of our community so yes we did include that Other comments or edits? So typically when um, for our, our policy with policy, <laughs> just to get super wonk on everybody, um, is that we have a first read. Um, any edits uh, such as uh, what we have um, on policy BDF are sent back to any revisions or questions um, for further exploration is sent back to the policy subcommittee. And then we come back with for, for a second read and potential vote, depending on the magnitude of changes and edits in between. Ms. Stancer? Um, I have a question. So it, the term is to be one year for in, in both these situations. What if you have an advisory committee that continues to work that is not just bounded by the academic year. What do you do about appointments in that case? The, um, the proposed policy does, I can't remember, uh, number five. Um, so members, it, it specifically says members may be reappointed. So um, as, as I understand that, and we can tweak that if, the, if that's not clear, the way sort of we understood that was that they may be reappointed, but it's requiring us to sort of assess at, at every year on an annual basis 
um, what the task is for that advisory committee and, and the membership. So much in the same way that we are asking ourselves to do that for our subcommittees, standing subcommittees. Yeah, the, the assessment working group, I think that lasted for about eight years. So that just kept rolling over. And I know that when I was on the field, that went for over two years and they just, it just rolled over. Any other thoughts? So um, seeing none, um, there's, uh, we, and, and the um, policy subcommittee, I can't remember, I'm gonna look to my committee, other committee members, if we, what date we had, six, I believe it's next week. I think it's next um, Monday. It's Monday, yeah. So um, other, anybody is welcome to join us. Um, if, if you have other thoughts on these policies, um, after after tonight, um, but the policy subcommittee will take another look at these um, on Monday and at a future meeting come back to that. Great. So we will move on to our next item, which is our meeting calendar, um, which also is in our packet. So one of the I think the key point here, um, trying to get us back to meeting twice a month. Thank you, page 56. Um, trying to get us back to a more regular schedule of twice a month meetings, not every week. Um, and um, what I would like to propose is uh, that we meet um, in August and kick off our meetings for the school year with a retreat. Um, and between now and and we can spend our next meeting if if that's amenable to folks um picking a date then we can at our next meeting when we get to future agenda planning we can talk about sort of goals um, and ideas for that retreat um i i there I have lots of uh, thoughts swirling in my mind but i think the most important thing is for fixing on sort of what would be an appropriate week or date for that we can do a, a doodle poll but if we know, for example, you're on vacation the week of the 16th, then we won't even bother doodle pulling that particular week. So I think first, are folks up for a retreat um, in August? And are there any weeks in uh, any of those two weeks that are off the table for anybody? Ms. Spitzer. Um, yes to a retreat. And um, I will, unfortunately, well, Unfortunately, for this purpose, I'll be on vacation the week of the 16th. Um, so hopefully nobody's on the week, vacation the next week. And I'd also just plug for maybe having it be in person if that's an option. Um, a retreat on Zoom just seems kind of sad to me. That was my next question, is if folks would be up for in person. Let's say. Um, the, I'm seeing lots of hints. So uh, uh, Ms. Kenny and then Mr. Dentling. Uh, I am unavailable the week of the ninth right yep the week of the ninth and i think yes in person would be great i think also the rules are changing soon next week this week about the ability for open meeting law to be virtual um so i i'm not sure we're gonna have a choice <laughs> that starts tomorrow it, you go there's no more no more of this virtual type meetings as of tomorrow. Mr. Demling? Yeah, it actually starts at 12.01. So Chairman McDonald, let's keep on the agenda tonight or else we might get in trouble. Um, so uh, plus three to what Ms. Spitzer said. Um, yes to a retreat. Yes, I think it should be in person. And I am on a vacation the week of the 16th. Otherwise, yes, let's please do this. Good job coordinating calendars there, Mr. Denling and Ms. Spitzer. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Dr. Morris. So, so two things, just uh, in a more serious approach, yes, in, in four and three quarter hours, um, that, that virtual meetings goes away, but you know, it's likely the case that within a couple of days um, that that will be extended and give committees the option. I'm not, I'm not trying to engage the committees. And the larger question of that right now, um, I think um, 
so just to push the point, I don't know if anyone has an issue with the week of the 23rd. Out of the two weeks, you know, the chair said, um, it seems like a couple people have a challenge the week of the 16th, but, you know, and we can do it poll the date, but I just wonder if we can at least get to the, you know, both for, for, the, for you all, but also for the community to know that, we're, you know, we'd be looking to do a retreat that week of the 23rd. Certainly is okay with me. There are new teachers back that week, so I'd probably push for earlier in the week, but um, we, we can sort that out later. Great. If there's no other um, concerns with the week of the 23rd, then we'll um, look at dates and come back um, on that. Um, and I think any other, I, uh, the only thing to call out on the region um, is the Amherst uh, election schedule is on a different sequence or timing cadence than um, our other three towns. Um, so Amherst elections are in November, um, so we will um, potentially need to reorg well, need to uh, formally reorganize um, uh, at the beginning of January when the new, so unlike other towns in Amherst, if uh, the election happens in November, then any new members aren't seated until January. Um, uh, so that's why the reorganization happens in January. If there's no other comments, then we will go to scan the room. Nope. Uh, next up is uh, that's, um, updates from uh, member towns on plans regarding sixth grade moving to arms. Uh, does anybody have any updates? Ms. Kenny. Nothing new in Pelham. Dr. Morris. Uh, can I maybe expand on the nothing new part? It, it was discussed at a recent meeting for the Pelham School Committee. I think there was, and, and certainly Ms. Dancer, Ms. Kenny, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there was openness to the general concept. There was no urgency to the conversation. Um, so uh, I think there was an opposition to somewhere down the road having that conversation. I didn't get the sense it was opposition to any other towns doing whatever they chose to do from the Pelham Elementary School Committee. But I also, there was no fires lit, uh, you know, uh, at that meeting about Pelham's uh, extreme interest or disinterest. I think it was very much a wait and see approach. Um, and, and, and Margaret and Sarah, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that was, that was sort of what I remembered. Um, I guess I, I would say, I I don't know if I agree with there were no fires lit. I think that I think the sense was that it was something the committee thought we should discuss. I don't we didn't certainly didn't talk about a timeline. Um, but I didn't feel like it was indifference. I saw a couple of hands go up and then go down. Oh, Ms. Kenny. Sorry, I should have been more clear in my nothing new. Uh, nothing since the last time the regional committee met and had this conversation. Like both what Dr. Morris and Ms. Dancer said are true and correct. I just <laughs> was trying to move us along. Nothing new since the last time we talked about this that region happened in Pelham. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Demling, did you have your hand up? No, I, unless I'm forgetting something, I think Amherst gave its last update at the last meeting, which is there's high level of urgency in Amherst to explore this. But I think that's what we said last time, right? Yes, I believe so. And Amherst, the Amherst School Committee is meeting next week to continue that conversation. Um, so at our next meeting, um, uh, if, if we'll have, we may have more to update at that point. Okay, if there's no more on that topic, then um, we can move on um, and bring in our colleagues, um, our other colleagues from Pelham. Um, and while uh, while they're joining us, I will call to order um, the Amherst School Committee at 7.23 p.m and we'll take a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Spitzer? 
Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Welcome. So over to you, Chair Hall. Um, and well. Okay. Um, seeing the presence of the quorum, I'll call to order while this they're meeting. Joining us, I will call to order. Yeah. Um, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee and start with roll call attendance. Uh, Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Mr. Menino. Menino present. Ms. Dancer. Dancer present. And Hall present, and Ms. Barlow did let me know uh, that at the last minute she couldn't make it tonight. Um, our first item is to approve minutes, um, and we have many, and I'm going to propose that um, that we we email all of our edits or comments, ads, whatever, to um, uh, Ms. Charkas, and, um, and maybe copy Sasha as well. Um, and then uh, we'll review them, um, the updated ones, uh, next meeting. I will call out that two of these um, minutes are already approved and posted on the website, so we do not need to review them again. That's January 5th and March 23rd. So all of the others, um, January 21st, February 2nd, February 16th, March 2nd, March 3rd, March 16th, and May 18th. Okay, um, moving on to public comment. Uh, we have no public comment this evening um, for the joint meeting there for Amherst committee. There will be some one for there. Um, and as always, uh, public comment is always accepted until 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting, um, either by voicemail message at um, 413-345-2949 or by email to the um, chair uh, in this case, myself, um, with a subject line public comment. So uh, moving on to the chair's update. Um, I do have one update that I would like to share. Um, and I'm going to apologize because I'm going to be reading. Um, as uh, many at home and in our, com in our committee are aware, we are in talks with representatives from the APEA the union that represents teachers, clerical staff, and paraeducators in the regional Amherst and Pelham school districts to extend their contract and negotiate wage and salary increases. The APEA leadership has made several public statements about our negotiations, and we've received a large volume of email related to those statements. So I'd like to respond and offer some broader context. Our teachers, paraeducators, and staff are the heart of our schools and are critically valuable in delivering on our mission for the students and families of our districts, which is why we offer competitive pay that is above the average in our region. And this is why we included two types of pay increases in our budget for FY22, a cost of living adjustment or COLA increase of 1% for all staff and step increases for staff who are early in their years of service in our districts. About two thirds of paras in the district are eligible to receive a step increase this year, on average about 4%. With a 1% COLA on top of that, step eligible paraeducators will receive on average a 5% overall increase in pay next year. There are other approaches to pay increases, of course, and we've told the APEA that we are open to other approaches, including allocating more of our budgeted COLA dollars toward paraeducators. Our talks with the APEA this year have been around only the COLA increase, not the step increases for teachers and paras that are already included in our budget. In considering other approaches, we must recognize that our budget not only must reflect our values, it also must balance. And an increase in spending in one area requires an equal cut in spending elsewhere. A larger increase in pay for one group of teachers or staff requires either a smaller increase for another group of staff or additional cuts beyond what it already is planned in our FY22 budgets. These are the types of trade-offs that we must make in order to consider a larger increase for one group of educators. We look forward to continuing discussions and reaching agreement with the APEA on an approach that both reflects our values and is in line with our fiscal reality.
With that, um, I'm going to look around and see if there's um, any announcements from school committee members. Ms. Stancer. Um, I would just like to say that last week I went to the climate change carnival at the middle school and was very impressed with all of the activities that were going on. There was an article in the Gazette about the stream table, but there were lots and lots of other things as well. Um, and it was great to see the kids. I think when I was there, the seventh graders were out uh, taking part in everything. So I just um, wanted to say, I think that the teachers did a great job organizing and um, the AP, the Amherst Education Foundation provided a grant. Um, so they were able to bring in some speakers uh, from outside. And uh, so that was really terrific as well, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lord. I wanted to say a, a huge thank you and gratitude to the high school team, the graduation team, all everybody who came together, the volunteers to make graduation such an amazing moment. And, and um, I want to say congratulations to our graduates as well, but all the people that put hours and hours and hours and hours of work in, thank you. It was phenomenal. As mentioned um, earlier in the um, regional only meeting, the policy subcommittee of the regional school committee is meeting on Monday evening. Um, and I'm just going to look at the time. Monday evening, the 21st at uh, 6.30 p.m. And that will be on StreamYard or um, YouTube streaming for folks um, to watch from home. Uh, assuming that we are still um, able to meet remotely, otherwise it will be in person. Any other announcements? Okay. Uh, so we will move on to our new and continuing business. And tonight we have a presentation um, for the superintendent evaluation artifacts. That is also in our packet and that is um, begins on page 58. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Moore. Thank you. And, and as is my past practice, I'll be rather brief in describing a, a not so brief document. Um, but really the goal of, of this is just to orient the committee to the doc to the document and slight variations of uh, from previous years of how we've done this. When I met with um, Kerry, who's uh, heading up the superintendent evaluation committee, um, tried to have a balance. Last year obviously was was a very different year and we had sort of very quick one pager with artifacts um, and and maybe what we did two years ago and trying to find that right balance. So um, you know one thing one piece of feedback I received about the formatting or content was in past years each element was sort of separately uh, described and uh, lots of information was repeated because the artifacts applied to more than one standard or element uh, in the standards document. And so uh, this year I combined, um, there was a couple places where I combined elements that were I was reporting on and uh, that reduced greatly. I mean, there's one or two things that get repeated, but they're, they're few and far between. So hopefully that's easier for school committee members to digest uh, and not feel like, oh, I read this four pages ago and, and where does this fit in? So hopefully that works. But of course, if the committee does it for the committee, I'm happy to revert back next year. Um, I think it's important to note for the committee that um, the goal, and this is quoting from the DESE Evidence Collection Toolkit, is to provide evaluators with a representative picture of my practice. It is not intended to be describe every single thing that's happened over the course of the year. So try to pick out representative pieces along the elements that were agreed to. Uh, that's described in the first page. On the second page of the document, it's it just goes over this, the goals for this year that were voted and agreed to by the committees. The third page describes the elements from that document that were um, from the, the overall standards document that were included. Um, and uh, again, then the last nine or so pages, um, eight pages, describe uh, in a narrative format some of the work that's happened that's representative of the in the elements that you that are listed. 
It has hyperlinks to the actual artifacts. Um, if anyone has any trouble with the hyperlinks, uh, please let me know. I tested them all. They should work, but uh, that doesn't always mean they do work. So, you know, if it, is anything that's missing, please let me know. And then it tries to just, you know, very kind of deliberately uh, go along the dimensions, starting with the elements one and then going on to element two and three and four. Um, and, uh, you know, find it finishing with the um, same as I have in the past years, a little different this year, we added a question, but a survey um, that's a more of a 360 degree survey, survey of kind of the senior leadership uh, in the district, both at the building base as well as at central office about uh, feedback for me and my performance, which uh, I utilize, you know, as we head towards next year uh, for my own professional growth. But uh, I don't want to belabor uh, a document that's been written uh, for the committee. I'm open to any questions or comments anyone might have, but I think that's as much uh, presenting as I was planning to do this evening. Thank you, Dr. Morris. That was brief. Um, and thank you. I, I, um, it might be helpful for the community um, to post just the artifact document um, separate because it is such a mammoth um, agenda packet. And I'm always, um, every year when we receive this artifact document, I'm always, it, it's just such a um, robust and in-depth reflection on sort of what, what all has gone on in the district in the past year. Um, a lot of which may have been covered in school committee updates and meetings. And so people who follow and watch every single one of our meetings um, might be aware of them. Um, but it's a great um, it's a great overview and update, I think, of, of, sort of all the all the things that have been going on in, in our district um, led by you. So thank you. Thank you. And we can do that tomorrow. Ms. Dancer. Um, I just wanted to say that at the very end, the superintendent evaluation survey link, I've not been able to make that work. Um, didn't work earlier today, and I just tried again. So um, if you have a chance to look at that. Yep, I will send that. Um, I think it, it, you have to download it, and it's an Excel file. I couldn't make it work as a PDF, but I will email that to the committees just as a standalone attachment file, um, either tonight or tomorrow morning. Any other uh, questions, comments? Mr. Demling. So uh, we have a timeline for filling out the uh, evaluation now. We should probably um, talk about A, because the, as I recall in the past, chairs have a little bit of work to do in order to prep for the, the next meeting on this. Yes, our um, timeline is we would like um, all committees um, to get the their uh, survey responses in um, by a week from today. So that would be end of day on Tuesday the 22nd. And I define end of day at, as like bedtime. <laughs> Whatever your bedtime is, but it should be still June 22nd. Um, <laughs> that, that is my ask for the Region Committee and the Amherst Committee. Um, Ms. Hall, I don't know. Um, for the yeah. Pelham School Committee. Same for Pelham, thanks. Mr. Demling. It, it just as a reminder for anybody who's new, um, if you are multiple committees, then you submit multiple evaluations. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're doing, it's, you know, the form will look the same to you, but you're you're looking at it from, you know, you, you just gotta put your different hat on and submit it again, submit it twice. Mm -hmm. Ms. Stancer. Um, I would also mention um, for people who haven't done this before that on the, I think it's on the DESI website, there are some videos about doing the superintendent evaluation that people might find useful. So if you go to, just go to DESI and uh, it was not hard to find. I'm sorry, I should have the link in front of me, but I don't. I'll try to send that out along with that artifact if I can dig it up uh, quickly, um, just as a tool. There also is a, um, it was a lunchtime webinar recently within, the, maybe not that recently, that MASC um, did on superintendent evaluation. So that, um, those, their webinars have been, inter have been helpful. So that may also be a good resource. 
Any other questions, comments? Mr. Sullivan? Yeah, I, ju I just want to give another shout out to Audra Grasinski from Leverett and Emily Marriott from Pelham because they spent, I can't even tell you, it was well over 50 hours to get this thing rolling when we had when we revamped it in 2018. I just want to give them another thank you. It's, when you come in um, now, it feels like a, a fairly well-oiled machine. So um, thank you for reminding us, Mr. Sullivan. If there's no other uh, comments or questions, okay. then we'll move on to our next item, which is our second read um, and possible vote on policy ECBFA, which is a revision to a policy that we cre created a year ago on face coverings. And that is also in our packet on page 69. And it's a very short policy. Uh, when we read it the first time, uh, there were no um, edits or revisions proposed. So the policy subcommittee did not review it again. Um, I just wanna look around and see if there's any other comments. Ms. Stancer. Uh, I'd be happy to make a motion. Um, I move to accept the draft revisions to policy EBCFA face coverings. Are you making a motion for the regional school committee? Uh, yes. I move for the regional school committee um, to accept the draft revisions to policy EBCFA face coverings. A second. Is there any further discussion from the region? Seeing none, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Then McDonald's aye. The motion passes for the region uh, unanimously, eight to zero. Um, I will make a similar motion for the Amherst School Committee to approve the revised policy EBCFA face coverings. Is there a second for Amherst? Second. Moved by McDonald's, second by Harrington, and we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The, mashes. the motion passes unanimously for Amherst, uh, five to zero. Chair Hall. Um, I will make the motion for Pelham. I move to accept the draft, the, sorry, the revised policy EBCFA face coverings. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Kenny. We'll do any further discussion. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Thank you. Um, so moving right along, we've now caught up to our agenda, so that's great. Um, we have a warrant report. So I will look to Ms. Spitzer for the region, Ms. Hall for Pelham, um, if you have warrants to report. Um, I'll wait, we have a Pelham only meeting next week, so I'll just wait and do mine then. Ms. Spitzer, do you have any? Sorry, I believe I do, I'm sorry. <laughs> it seems too early because I, I have one, so I'll need mine. Okay, go ahead and I'll, I'll get mine up. Um, I have one for Amherst. Um, so I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature, tables in the amount of $123,304.52 for a warrant dated June 4th. This includes general fund expenses of $68,896 for 
revolving fund expenses of $13,556.49, grant fund expenses of $24,742.91, CARES Act funds of $3,300, behavioral and mental health funds of $6,848.24, miscellaneous of $199.50, Article 13 funds of $5,692.38 and a gift of $69. And I signed that um, today, June 14th, 2021. Ms. Spitzer. All right. Um, so I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $631,654.71. For the warrant dated June 3rd, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $626,869.71 and grant fund expenses of $4,785. And this was signed by myself on June 4th, 2021. Thank you. Great. So um, next up, we have accept gifts. And I don't believe we have gifts tonight. So, Chair Hall. All right, I move to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Kenny. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. Good night, everyone. Goodbye. Good night. And I'll make a similar motion to adjourn the Regional School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. No discussion. So we'll go roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Dancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So the Regional School Committee is adjourned. Thank you. Bye. And moving right along, we have one. Um, next up for the Amherst is public comment. And we have one public comment um, for the Amherst meeting. We have no voice comment. Um, that uh, document is posted um, on the agendas page of our school committee page. Um, so we have uh, one item of business tonight, which is a presentation of the early childhood report. Yep. Uh, so I um, will be sharing this update. Kristen Hayes, who presented with us. Uh, quite some time ago, felt like it's, it's fall of 2019, which uh, we all know uh, feels like forever ago, but she's um, a consultant who we supported by the town and the district to come in and look about early childhood, zero to five in our community. She did a follow-up to her report. She's unable to present tonight. I want to be really clear, I am not an early childhood expert, uh, but I've talked to Ms. Hayes and I think I can catch some of the highlights of this report. Uh, and she's willing to come back, you know, some other time in the future if the, you know, makes sense for the community. But just her, her scheduling of the next three meetings tonight, next week, and the 29th didn't allow for her to be present. So um, we thought rather than have folks wait, uh, we'd make it a public document and I'll do my best to try to, to report on it. Um, and, and again, I'll just, I'll use for people following at home, I'm going to use her page numbers, not the one in the packet, but they are in the packet um, as reference. So. Uh, page one in her of her report sort of highlights some of the differences or distinctions between the report the last time and the report this time. So some significant changes are that updated 
demographic and birth data was included uh, and other sources of demographic um, different demographic in information was included. Uh, there was also a little bit of a closer look at facilities, uh, but m perhaps most importantly, um, an overview of President Biden's proposed universal preschool plan uh, was included. And, and whether we don't know that will happen, that will be uh, that potentially have a pretty significant effect on uh, plans of many communities um, as it relates to early childhood education. Page two has her three key findings, which I would actually argue is four key findings. And I told her I would argue that, so it's no surprise to her. The first is that um, there's licensed childcare for about 40% of Amherst young children, ages zero to five. Um, that's less than half, that's not good. Um, and much like everything else in Amherst or any community, um, folks who have the financial means to afford the full array of options that are available to typically get the full array of options available. Folks in Amherst who don't have the full of, you know, don't have that financial means uh, have much more limited options, if any at all. And therein lies the problem. So the second main finding is the last sentence of that first one, and I'm just going to read it aloud. Expansion of services to three to four year olds is the focus of this report. However, childcare sots for children birth to three remains the single biggest need in the community. It's a hard one because this isn't, you know, we don't have a, you know, our, our charge starts at three-year-olds with disabilities and in our case with or without because we have an integrated program. Uh, she has stressed and, and continues to stress and I want to stress that uh, the birth to three piece is really just distressing. Um, that our community, which I think rightfully has social, you know, equity and diversity uh, in everything we do, we live in a community right now that is underserving uh, infants and young children, particularly that population uh, who are uh, income eligible with not enough not enough care. And if you look at any piece of research, you know I work in a district and have always worked in districts that are three to twenty ages three to twenty one, uh, zero to three or zero to two is incredible, incredibly critical time for brain development. And it's distressing to me that we continue to um, have this problem in this community. Um, I'll leave it there, but I, I think it's really worth noting. The, in my opinion, third key finding is that um, there's a lot of demand for care out, for children outside the home because most, uh, many families or most families uh, typically have all the family, all the family members, adults in the home, however many there are, are working parents. Um, that, that our community doesn't have as many uh, folks who either choose or are able to be at home throughout the day to provide care for their children. So there's a real need in the community that way. And her last finding is that their preschool continues to serve high need students um, and really well, um, but that's, and, and there is an integrated program there but the, in terms of universal preschool, um, right, that, that's not what we do. We don't, we don't have space or staff, or we are not designed uh, for any three to five year old in the community to, to receive a preschool education from our district um, or our community. And so there really is this sort of unfilled need in our community there. There's a tremendous amount of demographics. I'm not going to go over uh, all of those. I think you know she highlights um, you know some mild changes demographically. In my opinion, mild, um, not huge swings in terms of numbers. We have some declining birth rate. We knew that, but again, this is 2017 data, so uh, every year you you find out a little bit more. But we're already backtracking quite a ways. Um, and looking at licensed child care providers in Amherst, uh, looks a bit at children in the household under six. Uh, and how that works in the labor force, how she comes up with findings. But a lot of the tables and, and research is really incredibly interesting, someone like me, but it really supports her findings more than, you know, requires uh, more description tonight. So I would encourage us to skip to page 10, because um, I think that's where things get uh, interesting and quite a bit more different uh, than the last time she presented. You know, in uh, not the far distant past, uh, the Biden administration has proposed what's called the American Families Plan, which proposes universal high quality preschool to all three and four year olds. Um, sticker shock for some people in, in Congress, not for others, but about $200 billion would be have to be allocated. Um, and so uh, that is when we said about what's different, that would be different if that passes. 
Uh, it potentially, you know, there'd be a tremendous amount of uh, new information that would come out from it, but it might create a funding stream to make many, many more things possible than exist with our current resources um, that we have here. Um, I think on page 11, she highlights that, um, you know, some undetermined pieces about where preschool classrooms would be located, uh, but the idea is that, you know, it could be within a mixed delivery system. So, you know, within a public school, even if we didn't run the program, we might, you know, be able to provide space and some overhead for preschool programs as part of this plan that may or may not be passed. And so that was really interesting to us. We, you know, we, she described a couple other districts that she's seen that have that model, that it's a mixed model where uh, the school retains its school characteristics uh, but includes um, basically offering space for other programs, very analogous to how we run our aftercare programs. So we have at the elementary level, we have aftercare programs in each of our elementary schools. We, do, we ourselves do not run those programs, but we provide space uh, and collaboration for them. That's an interesting model that's really different than what we've thought about in the past. Uh, I don't have to tell you all, because you had a meeting last week about it, space is not in abundance in our current schools, uh, current school settings, um, but this bill hasn't also passed. Um, so I think we do have time to think about it um, and see how this develops in terms of what Congress does and how this plays out within Massachusetts, which I'm guessing is not a, going to be a quick process. Um, you know, there's a number of other parts of the law I won't get into, but I think it does offer hope, uh, more hope than we had before, even if this was done in the winter, for a funding stream that might help uh, us think about what's possible. But, you know, nothing in terms, just to be really clear, nothing in terms of uh, anything that would happen for the next academic year in the fall. Um, I think on page 12, there's really some really important highlights. Uh, and I'm sorry to go through this, this in, in a linear way, I guess the opposite of what I did with artifacts. Um, but I think it, I'm just trying to pick out the highlights that I think are most valuable. Um, what's required for universal preschool that's different than ours is that it's, you know, has to be, has to serve all age eligible children, right? So it's, this is not an integrated special education model. This is uh, all children model. Um, I think another worthy thing of mentioning is that it would have to be much longer days than our current preschool program is designed for. Um, so um, kind of what's considered high quality at the federal level is a th roughly a thousand hours a year which is six hour service day and 180 days. It, those numbers should seem familiar because they're roughly the same numbers that uh, would occur for a public school in a traditional way. You know, 180 school days, six hours a day. Uh, that's not our current preschool model. Um, so again, we'll have to wait to see uh, how things play out over time. But you know, this isn't just taking our pre current preschool model and expanding this. This would be uh, potentially a pretty significant shift uh, or addition to what we're currently able to offer. Um, and then, you know, she goes into some details, benefits and drawbacks of locating our current model where all of our preschool classrooms are at Crocker Farm uh, versus having at least some level of preschool classes in each early childhood center. Uh, There's not a right or wrong, and she's very clear about that, but I think the tables are really helpful if we get to the place where we're able to consider uh, some options here. And the last thing I want to highlight is starts on page 17, which is the recommendations. Um, so um, I think the, the, the sentence that, that stands out to me is um, a couple of lines down. Having witnessed the rollout of universal preschool in other states and cities, the single biggest lesson learned is there's been collaboration early and often uh, is, was, is what results in a system of care that meets the needs of families and their young children. Um, so instead of having the mentality of, which I think I went into this with, you know, we should sort of own this. It's about perhaps collaborating with uh, partner agencies and seeing what's possible over time. Uh, and, you know, that's a, that's a mind shift for us. I think as schools, you know, frankly, over years, not just our schools, we've, um, we, we, we sort of have taken on lots of, uh, right, for good reasons, lots of kind of um, social issues and social uh, responsibilities. And, and kind of the feedback here is our social responsibility is to work with early childhood providers uh, if this is, comes to pass and see what we can offer, and particularly as it comes to space expertise, professional development. So she recommends in fall that we reach out to private providers to determine their current enrollment uh, to try to get a better sense of where we are cur currently situated. We have seen this drop of enrollment both in our schools as well as live births. We wanna track that over time. And that's a step we can certainly do uh, in the fall. Um, she also recommends understanding better from our community partners what they believe the early 
learning needs of the, are of the community. Uh, I will be candid that the pandemic has um, shifted things. We're getting a tremendous number of referrals from private daycare providers and, and preschools uh, for special education needs. It's been hard for us to parse out what's been the experience of being a young child during a pandemic as a percentage of their life. We're talking about kids who have spent a third of their lives in a pandemic. Um, you know, the rest of us on this call, it's a much lower percentage. And so uh, with our early childhood providers, we've been collaborating a lot because of that and how do we assess uh, where kids are and what their needs are. Um, second recommendation is um, to look at our internally at our program and uh, what standards we wanna meet as high quality, especially if the kind of the federal system moves forward uh, with President Biden's proposal. Um, the third proposal, you know, she's very clear, remains a challenge to recommend what districts should do as far as the location of preschool slots. Again, we talked about this for probably over an hour last night about space in the elementary schools. I don't wanna rehash that, but the short story is we don't have a lot of space at the elementary level. Um, that could change over time, enrollments could go down. We have a building project that's happening, um, but it may be the case that partnering with Head Start, um, we may have a vacated building in a couple of years. Uh, that we may want to think about it. So I think it's just, it's not about developing a specific plan because I think there's too many variables right now, but keeping an open mind all along that uh, there may be, we may be able to provide space and maybe that's the best thing we can do to promote preschool access in the town of Amherst. So I think that's a helpful frame for me. Um, and the fourth one is, is again, you know, the additional slots, you know, what does that depend on? We have to look at live births, you know, providers in the area um head start requirements as well as the proposed child care bill so you know in summary for me this is an incredibly helpful report to understand the needs of our community more um, as it relates to three to five year olds it sets a roadmap if a proposal goes forward in this uh, federal government to start partnering with our community agencies private preschools to see what's possible particularly head start along that dimension um, and to continue access Kristen hayes you know, if that goes on, she can be a helpful conduit to have help with those conversations um, and keep her connected to our community because I think she's been an invaluable resource for the preschool coordinator, for myself, and uh, for us as we want to start forward. So sorry for that long-winded summary, um, but I thought I would try to just highlight some of the key variables and, and provide some context based on my conversations with Kristen. But I'm open to any uh, feedback, comments, um, or questions that the committee would have. Questions? Ms. Fitzer. So thank you so much for this presentation. And I, as a parent of a, a two and four year old, I spent a lot of time um, thinking about accessing and child care for, for both very young, the zero to three group and, and the four year old group now. And I know from just talking to other parents, the the supply does not meet the current demand. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, um, I wanted to highlight one thing when you're talking about um, partners, and I think it's important to point out there are providers who aren't on this list. And I'm thinking particularly about um, UMass and also Hampshire College. Um, they both have centers and they're made, I mean, I'm thinking about UMass as a major employer. So one of the things I think that's unique when we're thinking about care for for really young kids is that for some for some families, you know, it's it's about socialization, but for others, it's really about just enabling them to get to work in a way that I don't think elementary education necessarily is. Like you need to know your child is safe and cared for while, while you're at work. And for this really young age group, it's 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 essential. So um I'm thinking about UMass as being one of our primary employers in, in the in the town and also you know would be a very convenient spot and they do have a large program so I just want to make sure that since they're not on table five that we don't lose them from the conversation and same thing with Hampshire College because I know they've continued to offer uh, offer um, in-person child care um, as well so Anyways, this is a long-winded way of saying that I, I would be curious. I don't know if there's any way to track this, but for our Amherst and families, um, there are probably also people coming into Amherst who might be looking for childcare near where they work, who aren't necessarily living in Amherst. Like it feels like this is one of those things where you could have families um, who utilize 
all of the places listed on five who are not necessarily in the same way like zone to our district so it it just complicates the picture i'm not saying i have a solution in the same way some families may be opting to send their kids to um, child care that's closer to their place of employment whether it's springfield or you know wherever wherever they work um so thanks for this and and i also just want to say is there a I think it's important we also engage with those who are family-based providers because I know there's a lot of that in this. I mean, you know, I, I've used um, family-based providers myself, and I think um, I'm excited about this rollout of um, not rollout, but the potential for universal pre-K. But I do think it would be interesting to see, like, what is it going to mean for for those family providers who aren't center-based? So, thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so um, thank you for this overview of the report. Um, I also appreciated the update. Um, you know, so I, I tend to think of expanded pre-K, uh, <laughs> getting late, expanded pre-K um, through, through the lens of, of what the core mission of our public schools is. And that's the way I, th I think about it is, is uh, for students with disabilities um, starting at age three before they get get to kindergarten and, and that's so that's the population we serve and we do that for free and if we're going to expand that then we need a reliable funding source in order to expand that that core mission and I, I feel like we, we when we socialize this idea with the community and when we engage um, our local governments and other social service agencies we have to start from that point of view because it's, it's it's the first thing that that answers the question well why don't you just do it Right, like, and and it's 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 more than just space. You know, we ha we have such intense space space issues, obviously, in our district, that everything that space seems to dominate every conversation. And obviously, there are variables in expanding, potentially expanding preschool, um, that relate to space. But you know, from my understanding, even if if we had a gleaming new building tomorrow, we wouldn't necessarily be able to expand preschool because you still have to staff it. <laughs> you still need resources and you still need a plan to fund that into the future. And, and that, that costs money. And so unless the Amherst School Committee budget is greatly expanding, we can't greatly expand preschool. I mean, that's, that's the zero sum of budgeting. And so, um, so I appreciate that this report frames any significant expansion uh, with, with the, you know, ties it to this, this federal funding proposal which, you know, I mean, unfortunately right now is still just a proposal. I mean, fingers crossed, hopefully it goes through, but right now it's just a really great idea. And we are, we are quite a long way uh, from those dollars actually getting approved, getting into law, getting to the state, getting to our district, getting to our hands to where we can actually execute on them. Um, so it's, you know, and, and I, hate, I hate to sound like I'm throwing cold water on the idea of should we expand preschool? Because for all the things we've mentioned for the, for the daycare, for the social, for early academic intervention, for, for all of those wonderful things, you know, there, there's strong universal support for this idea, which in our community, which which I think is good. But I do think that part of our role uh, on the committee is to is to temper expectations somewhat with the reality of, of, of the situation. Um, and you know, the other thing I wanted to ask about, Dr. Morris, is this, this you know servicing the zero to three. So public schools don't do that. Um, and yet, you know, you talked about um, how you feel distressed that we have uh, this, this lack of access in our community, particularly for those who are economically disadvantaged and that those options are, are limited. Um, and I wonder, why don't you just expand on that a little bit? I mean, I, I would imagine that inequitable access to early uh, preschool is, is an issue in, in many communities, but is, is there something particular about um, what we provide as a town or as, as a service that we're not doing because because when i think about potentially expanding that i think about simple ideas like well what about subsidies what about another line item in the town of amherst budget right if 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 people are passionate about this idea and they understand that zero to three isn't part of the core mission of public schools should they be going to the town council and advocating for that so you just talk a little bit about that i like your ideas um and um uh seriously i do um, so, you know, the short story is the earlier, earlier in a person's life, you can provide high quality structured care. That's much more effective, you know, and, and you're talking about people, but, you know, from a 
from a return on investment perspective, if you want to think about it in that way, the interventions you provide earlier uh, are much more successful and prevent much larger problems down the road, right? And that's just longstanding, you know, research. If you look at like Ron Ferguson's research, I mean, he's really shifted. So in much of his career talking about schools and, and to this point, he's mostly, he works at Harvard and does the Achievement Gap Institute and a whole bunch of other neat stuff. And, you know, he he's so focused on zero to two right now because, you know, he's an economist, did a bunch of research and said, wow, we should really be investing a lot in zero to two and in early parenting and, and all sorts of things. So um, we, you know, the town right now doesn't have sort of the structures around that. And uh, it, it's twofold. One is that's so important for young children, uh, for families who make the choice that they want care, uh, that they're provided high quality care. It's also really important for families to be able to work, uh, right? So it, it hits on both ends because if families can't work because they can't afford childcare, um, then, uh, that, that leads to multiple negative uh, implications for the family, both financially, but also for child development. Um, if that's not by choice, that's kind of by default. Uh, or people are working night shifts so that they can, because they have coverage at night, but then they're trying to sleep through the day and take care of their young one. I mean, you know, everyone on this call has had a young one at one point in time. That's not a good model, right? I, I, um, and so um, I think it actually spills out into many other challenges within our community that, that many families have, particularly, as you noted, uh, families faking, facing economic stressors. Um, so yeah, that, it, it's very difficult. And, and I'll be blunt that we see the impact on that, right? When, when we receive students, uh, and one of the first things, as you've all experienced, is we do uh, a meeting between the counselor, the principal, and the parent, and we get you know, developmental history. Um, you know, it's families struggle mightily when they have young children. That's true probably for many, many families, if not all families, uh, but those struggles aren't equitably distributed, right? Families who are able to work um, and, you know, pay for high quality care, um, kids' ability to get socialized um, and have and be in a supportive environment, it's incredibly valuable down the line. And I don't mean just like ABCs, it's really just a structure and being with other people, right? It's not like I'm looking for, or I believe that this needs to be an overly academic focused early childhood care. It's actually, you know, the best ones are about creativity, discovery, exploration, and uh, being in a group, right? Those are core foundational skills that kids can learn in high quality early childhood settings. And, um, but there's a cost to that. So I, I could go on forever about this. I won't. Uh, and, and um, you know, as a, the first thing I sent to today, mentioned tonight, I'm, you know, not quite my best self uh, this evening, um, but uh, it, it, every time someone comes back and says that or talks about either universal preschool or zero to three in particular, um, it seems like it, it, it doesn't uh, mobilize uh, action in the way here, in the way the other, and I don't mean to criticize, I love Amherst, but it just, I haven't seen movement on that and we know the long-term implications short and long-term implications of that. There's, you know, we talk about late start. There's ample evidence just the same way there is on late start on the implications for families and the equity, you know, you know, I think one thing that I remember Dr. Ferguson saying is if you think about uh, where students are, if they don't have the, you know, some structured experiences at an early or young age uh, and families for a whole host of reasons aren't able to provide that, you know, it's really hard to make that up later. Right, it's just brain development, and so uh, I'll leave it there. But but um, I do think you know, in the medium to medium term, you know, whatever the actions are for communities like Amherst that have our demographics that um, understand uh, are committed to equity, I'd like to figure out ways that we recognize this as a real issue. I know our former this isn't a critique of the current one, as she's doing a lot of work on other fronts. Our former health director Julie Fetterman, who was on board for the for the first part of this project felt really strongly because she saw it from a, not academic, but actually from a health perspective, um, being the health director for the town. She saw the implications of the lack of uh, high quality care that many of our families are able to access um, and the long-term implications from a health perspective as well. It's not just about reading and math and, and things like that. So I'll stop. I think it's a really, um... I don't know what the right adjective is, but a really needy discussion, I think, and that we, I feel like we need to continue to come back to because I, um, I don't, you know, just speaking for myself, the, the, the need is, is, 
is obviously great. Um, and it's something that I personally care deeply about. And I would share sort of the question that Mr. Demling started to raise, which is to what extent, what is the role of the district in solving that? Um, and is it, you know, like, is, it's not, not should we, but how, um, I think is really, really the question. I think we, I, I'm just looking at folks' faces. I don't want to speak for others, but I, you know, I think, you know, people care deeply about this. We recognize the, the need for it. How do we do that? And I, I, I go back to, I think you called it out, Dr. Morris, the one of her key components is, uh, comments was about collaboration early and often. And I, and I wonder if sort of exploring that is really um, how we go about it, really, because maybe it isn't that the school provides the solution, but that we provide the collaboration and the on-ramps um, for those students into our kindergarten, as well as for the, the programs that we currently, that currently meet our mission. Um, and I know that we're not also, or, or it's not meet our mission, but part, right, in our current mission, right? Um, and I know that there's, there's challenges in space for just meeting our current programming goals. Um, that that's, that's one piece of the, the challenge as well. So, because I, you know, it, it's, it's a funding question as we have declining enrollment at the, the older grades and sort of the, the painful cuts that we had to make this year and, and will continue to face and have to have those conversations as, as we're then expanding our, our population to earlier and earlier ages. It, you know, the pot becomes even smaller for some of the other things that we want to do for older students. So it's not a question of if we do it, I think it really is how and how much of that, what is the role that the district and the school uh, schools will play in that? Um, and maybe it's facilitator and leader of the conversation as opposed to provider. Um, I, I don't have any further thought, uh, other questions. Mr. Gelling? Yeah, I, I really like that idea. I, th I think I think uh, a, a possible way forward, I mean, not this month, but um, possible way forward uh, would be maybe a joint meeting with the town council. I mean, to be blunt, we don't we don't control the purse strings, right? <laughs> you know, we, we, we get, you know, the school committee, we decide what to do. With with the purse that we're given, but we don't we don't control the size of that. Um, and so, if we're talking about you know a community social service that you know a town is investing in, um, it, it's interesting that I think the superintendent would would be asked to lead that facilitated that lead that facilitated conversation. You maybe maybe you bring in some representatives from Reach, maybe you bring in some representatives from EI from from state services. And I think I think the the first step would just be education. Um, ed, I mean education of public representatives and the public, right? About just what, because I, I think there is still a, 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 not a great base level understanding of the basics that we just covered 20 minutes ago about what's the distinction between zero to three and four to five and special ed and non-special ed and, and where are the different uh, points that where, where families can access and, and how, what obstacles do to families uh, that others do not and, and what, what happens in our community. I think just starting from that, I think would be really helpful, um, you know, and then and then we'll see where it goes. Because ultimately, if we're talking about increasing funding, that's really something the public decides, right? It, it The public understands that and then the public either elects or advocates and, um, uh, you know, at the state or local level and, um, and you know, and we, and we go from there. But I, I think maybe that might be a, an opportunity. Other thoughts? Or any any folks who haven't spoken want to weigh in? Ms. Spitzer, is that a is that a hand? Sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to go before um, if um, if anybody else wanted to speak for the first time. I guess I I, I kind of I agree with everything um, in terms of facilitating. I, I think I would even push it a little bit further and for a lot of the reasons that Dr. Morris said, I think we could be strong advocates for um, the expansion. So not just saying we need to talk about it, but that we think it would actually benefit the families in our district because most of these kids who we're talking about providing care for are eventually, you know, ideally, I, I, I'm one of these kids attending our public schools, if, especially if it's, you know, the right fit for them. Um, anyways, so I, I, I guess I would just say let's let's just take a slightly strong, I would 
I would advocate for a stronger stance and say advocating for this expansion and, and doing as much as we can to, to help make it happen. Ms. Lohr. Yes, sometimes when I don't speak, it's just about efficiency, not that I don't have lots to say, um, but I definitely echo support of this. I learned when I was at Smith School for Social Work, I took preschool policy and just for education, but also for humanity, the long-term benefits and necessities of this earlier section that we're talking about are critical and hugely important. And I didn't know that before that class. So I also echo what um, Mr. Demling said about maybe all of us getting a little more education about, you know, this country is going to save trillions if we have universal access. But anyway, sorry. But thank you for opening space and encouraging me to talk. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I kind of, I, I definitely support the, the, the concept of advocacy and I see like the, I mean, I see the difference it's made in my own child's life having good quality child care at that, that early age, that zero to three point. And I'm definitely open to the, the concept of, of, you know, facilitating like collaborations with different groups and organizations. I do kind of have a cautious view of certain organizations that provide these services. So I, I would think like, I, I, th I think the, uh, the misspeak by by uh, Chairman McDonald. I, I concur with the concept of collaborating with groups that that actually do meet our values, our mission as a as a district. Like I would, I would, I would have serious problems supporting us channeling young children into a group that wasn't, you know, equ equity focused, um, multicultural, didn't have the multiculturalism value, those sorts of things. But yeah. There's a clear cut need and I think we need to do it the right way. Plus, I'm also in, in favor of better preparing our students to come into our, our district and be more productive in here. Um, so I don't know if we, we landed on um, next steps for this. Um, and I heard one suggestion that we look to have some joint meeting with the town council um, to go through the, the need and the basic education. Um, is that, uh, I think maybe we circle back and seeing lots of yawns and eye rubbing going on. So, <laughs> so um, why don't we, um, <laughs> um, we can e explore that. I, I don't, given the the nature of the the it, it's not a, a decision that we're going to be making overnight or anytime soon I think was like the, the key thing so I think there isn't a sense of urgency that we need to jump on this next week so um we'll, we'll come back to that um in our maybe in our future agenda planning okay. and speaking of uh, I think that's our last item of business um, right now. Would somebody like to make a motion? Um, I move to adjourn the Emerson School Committee. Lord second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord, and there's no discussion. So we'll take a roll call vote. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, nay. McDonald, aye. Um, despite Mr. Demling's wishes to keep meeting, we are now adjourned. <laughs>